get together and feel all right. It's not just a happy song. It's actually a song of condemnation of those who have done evil. But it's a song that withdraws judgment and says, let God judge them. Let God judge them. When Bob Marley was alive, particularly in the 70s and so on, his songs were banned. I mean, Bob Marley was seen as just this useless, this useless man who, had, who was blessed by God with a little color, and look how he wasted it with this raster thing. Right? Boy had a good nose, and look what he did to it. He just turned raster, <laughs> run up and down, and, and so on and so forth. Pretty boy. Look at him, pretty, pretty, pretty like that. Good hair. And he just raster it up. Right? Raster it up. So there was a feeling that Bob was a worthless one. He was just one of these dregs of society. Really. When Bob Marley moved to Old Hope Road, I mean to Hope Road, in that big mansion and so it was calamity. The neighbors were upset. That's why Bob Marley says, you know, um, he says, I want to disturb my labor. Blow them the full watts tonight in a rubber dub style. Tough luck. <laughs> Deal with it. What he was doing was bringing, bringing the ghetto uptown. This was bothersome to the middle class. The middle class was just a panic about this. So, so this idea that Bob Marley was some kind of great hero at the time, no, not really. No, not really. He is now, though. And why is that? Well, one, eventually people have had time to at least pay attention to what he was singing. Two, Bob Marley did something really, really innovative and really dynamic. He, he died, right? Yeah. <laughs> and if you <laughs> if you want to change that legacy, if you that's it, dying can be a real career choice. Could be a real career move, right? But Bob Marley's death made people have to relook at what his legacy was in ways that, and I'm being kind of funny, but it's true. He had to; they had to look at his legacy and pay attention to what it did. And and then finally, time does that because you see what has happened is and I was telling the class today I said my mother-in-law and I knew my mother-in-law before you know the, you know before, before the days and she she I remember sitting with her about a couple of years ago and she said that Bob Marley he's such a bright youth hey, he's such a boy I'm just talk truths and I'm saying good heavens what happened <laughs> <laughs> where, where does this come from but, but in fact, what has happened is, and she's, she was being completely sincere, because now something changed. Because you remember, well, I don't know if you know this, but you couldn't play reggae music near a church, much less in a church. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that for even a Christian to say they happen to stumble and listen to some reggae music on the bus. I mean, people used to go on the bus and sing hallelujah, hallelujah, so they could brown up the reggae music. Because, you know, if reggae music catch you, you know, you're going to start moving funny ways. <laughs> Satan going hold you and mash you up. <laughs> so, so, so all of these ideas were around it, but that has clearly changed, and people have paid attention to the lyric. And I've struggled with the question of what was his faith, and what, why does this music culturally move me? Why does it speak to me? And yet, even though I don't agree with his, his belief system, it's still moving me and it still has meaning to me. That is a real and useful kind of discussion to have. And I think that has taken place in the context of Jamaica. And the other thing is a negative kind of thing. It's a kind of commercializing of Bob Marley, right? A kind of commercializing that makes you sort of take the teeth out of Bob Marley. So you make Bob Marley a kind of Disney figure rather than the kind of guy that he was, which was a guy who came and said, I come, I come to conquer, I don't come to bow. That is Bob Marley's mantra. He said, when I go on stage, it's conquer me, conquer. You see me? But bud, that is, that is me, right? My music is my weapon. That's what Bob Marley said. My music is my machine gun. I'm a short man with my music. Yes. Oh, yes. Go ahead. You are in line. I just wondered if you could uh, tell us how you feel about the new, the new types of um, dance hall. And here I'm not talking about all of them. I'm speaking specifically about the new conscious movement in dance hall, the works of like the fireman, Cape yeah, Fulton, whose Fulton words are supposed to burn fire into, you know, and it's rhetorical. It's mm -hmm. meant to burn fire into mm -hmm. kind of ideology. Mm -hmm. Right? That yeah. it's an ideological kind of gunshot that, yeah. that they're working on. Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because the kind, of, the kind of flack and anxiety and fear that is being caused by, um, by dancehall music today is the same kind of fear and anxiety and so on and so forth that was, that was being placed on 
artists like Peter Tosh and, and, and Bob Marley and so on. You know, you know how many times the police beat Peter Tosh? Yeah. I mean, this close to death, they beat Peter Tosh so many times. Because Peter Tosh would go on stage and take out his spliff and start smoking it. And the police would say, all right, we're watching you. And as soon as he come off stage, they beat him. Beat him. <laughs> Peter Tosh was on stage at the One Love concert. And we don't see that. We only see Bob Marley doing his thing. But Peter Tosh spoke. He spoke for about 40 minutes, berating the government. Berating. And they were sitting right there. Cussing them. At first, him start use, you know, sort of um, euphemisms for bad words. And after a while, it looked like Peter Tosh is inside. Oh, what the heck. <laughs> and he just start cuss bad words. Enough bad word. Cuss, cuss, cuss. And tell, telling them truths about what was going on in society. Well, two weeks later, Peter Tosh was beaten close to death. Spent time in hospital because of it. What I'm saying is that the pressures on these artists were not small pressures. They were real pressures. And in a sense, the dance hall artists who are getting flagged are getting flagged because of some of the things that they are saying and so on. But that articulation is still part of the idea of addressing issues in society and challenging the issues in society through the lyrics that they are singing. And they are speaking into society and they are asking questions about the society. Now, not all dancehall music is going to be, you know, uplifting or anything like that. I mean, you know enough of dancehall to know that some of it is less than uplifting, even though apparently people still sort of, you know, the, the rhythm is hard to get away from, you know. You're kind of moving and you say, man, this, these, these lyrics are so slack, you know. <laughs> Oh, jeez, man, why do they have to say that? <laughs> you know, you know I, I don't agree with that. You know? I, I really don't agree with that. <laughs> okay, so, 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 <laughs> so, so, so the rhythm has a kind of pull on you and so on. But I would say that, I would say that it is reflective, it's reflective of where the society is. Right? But, but, but there are some positive things that have happened because I think one of the things that has happened is dance hall has opened the way for women artists to actually emerge and to start speaking in powerful and meaningful ways. People like Stan, Tanya Stephen, Patra, and Lady So and So on. Um, you know, it, it used to be just Sister Nancy who would be saying things about what was going on in society and what was happening to women. If you listen to Tanya Stevens, she's actually like a, like a firebrand feminist talking about issues in the society which would never happened in the, in the 70s. Women, you know, Judy Mort was the only one singing anything. So dance hall has opened up for the combative kind of thing where the women can actually speak up and address issues and in, in really interesting and important ways. And I, I say that it's always good, never dismiss, but engage, question, challenge, and what you have to do is then say, this I disagree with, this I agree with, and move on. But don't, don't dismiss it because, it, you know, it, it's, it's just frightening. This is what I, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. One of the things that I find fascinating is the fact that reggae as a musical art form is something that we can clearly describe as having started in the African diaspora yes. in the New World. Yes. And I was wondering whether or not there are any links, because one of the things that's happened is almost as if reggae has returned to the continent. Oh, yeah. I mean, in, in the Congo Kinshasa, yeah. I mean, African reggae yeah. is really the, oh, the, yeah. the means of expressing oh, yeah. what is going on on the African yeah. continent. So I was wondering whether or not there was a way to make a connection backwards to the continent yeah. that, that reggae in the new world is making some kind of, in making it's new great countries. question. It's a great question. And, and I mean, yeah, reggae, reggae has found its way back into the continent. And of course, you're talking about people like Majek Fashek. We're talking about Alpha Blondie. We're talking about Lucky Dubey. I mean, we're talking about these artists who, and there's an Ethiopian guy, I forget his name. And it's interesting.